Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want a quilt. So today we talk to Frances O'Rourke Dowell. She is an author. She has been on our show before, um, and she's here to talk to us about two things, her quilt fiction podcast um, and the new Facebook group. And they're doing a giveaway this week. Um, so go and subscribe and be part of the giveaway. So we're, it's timely. Um, and also her interviews with Quilt Alliance that she's conducting. I am Frances O'Rourke Dow, and I'm calling from, from snowy Durham, North Carolina. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk about stories today. We're going to talk about it in a number of instances, and we've talked to you before, so so we're not going to get into sort of who you are and what you do, but you're a writer um, and a quilter and amazing, and we had a great interview. Well, we've had two great interviews, one that had some sound problems, but this is our, uh, but one one that we released. So... Um, so stories. So tell me about your life in quilting in terms of stories, because you've got two things going on right now that are, are quilting and story related. Right. The two things I have going on are the Quilt Fiction podcast in which I am reading a novel uh, a, a couple chapters at a time. We started doing this in June and it will probably take until March to finish up with that story. That's really interesting. And it is I- a yeah, go ahead. It's Sorry. a work in progress. So, so I still cool. haven't finished the novel. So it's very interesting to get feedback. And now I have on Facebook a closed group. It's called the Quilt Fiction Club. And it's interesting because people are talking about the stories. And, and somebody said about the last episode, it's like, oh, I wish Dora had so-and-so. I'm like, oh, that's such a good idea. And I went <laughs> and wrote it down. But when I do this, I'm like, yeah, I should have thought of that. That's really interesting. So yeah, it's like, yeah. um, that's such an interesting way to be writing a book that you can get feedback on what they think. Like it's, the fans are helping you to sort of see where the character should be developed in some way, which is mm-hmm. so insanely cool. Have you ever it's done an- anything like that before? I have never. And it's a little dangerous because you can, sometimes people will say, oh, I want so-and-so to happen. I'm like, I don't know that so-and-so is going to happen and I don't want to disappoint <laughs> you. But um, right. so that can be, I have to ultimately not let that determine what people want or think determine the, the course of the story. But in this case, this was something that had already, I'd already written and someone commented, oh, yeah, I wish Dorothy had stepped in here. And I thought, oh, yes, that's really should have happened. So it was like getting at some really good editing. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. Right, because this is kind of like not the you are a very professional writer, so your first draft is not like many people's first draft, but you have the option to go back and revise. So I write bad first drafts. This is actually a better first draft, I think, because I am writing it with uh, knowing I have an audience for it. So it's forcing me to actually have a plot, which is a good thing in a novel. (laughs) (laughs) Totally, people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel my skills are actually as a reviser. I was talking with, with someone about that recently who's just uh, finished a first novel, started on the second, and she was like, I thought I would be be- I'd write a better first draft the second time around. It's like, no, 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 you'll be a better reviser the That's second really true. time. That's really true, yeah. It's interesting. I feel like I write either two ways, which is super precise. Like um, we were writing the copyright book. Um, my law student was driving, and we wrote like – we did the outline in the first chapter on the way back from Houston. So we had like five hours of just like writing in the car and it was very precise and lovely. Um, but most of my drafts are just way messy because I'm still trying to figure it out. Like that copyright book is easy because I'm not, we've kind of figured it out already, but Mm -hmm. when you haven't figured it out, that's where I think the process of writing is figuring it out as you go. That's why it's so messy. That's the first draft. You're trying to figure out what it is you what either what if you're writing nonfiction, what you actually think you you're really having to test your ideas. Yeah, right, right. And I do these like research drafts so that like I'm throwing everything in and then kind of making sense of it later. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. I don't know. So yeah, so it's, I can't imagine writing 
like not having it finished and writing and having it out there, that must be kind of a weird pressure thing of like, crap, I've got to figure out what's happening. Now. You know, like, like that's a weird kind of like, I don't know. It is. It's an insane thing to do. But on the other hand, I think it's not bad for me to feel obligated to an audience, A, to finish. Yeah, because it's I, a great I'm motivator. A person who would just say, nah, I'm not going to do this. Now I really have to finish. Yeah. I like the story. I like the character, so I will finish. Um, but it also, it, it actually in some ways it obligates me to do a better job on the first draft and to do some things as a writer. I don't typically plan very far ahead. I like things to happen organically, and that still is how I'm writing this. But I also am, am writing with the idea, it's like people are listening to the story. They, I want them to come back next week too. So yeah. how do I? How do I shape this chapter? How do I end it so they're going, oh, I need to know what happens next? And that for me is a, as a writer is really, really good. It's, that's a good kind of pressure to have. So it interesting. It does feel like, why am I doing this? I yeah. didn't have to do this. No one asked me to do it, and yet I'm doing it. Right. How far advanced are you writing to – like what's your process? Like how far advanced are you writing and then recording and then releasing? Let's see. It's getting closer. <laughs> Things are getting closer to closer together. I think at this point, I'm about five or six chapters ahead on the writing. We actually, and I'm just a couple, I have this week's episode ready to go. Um, usually I record the episode a week or two in advance. So, and my husband edits and, and um, you know, edits the sound and, and that takes a while so we just for a while we were way ahead but it's getting as you know life breaks right, in life happens things get busy it's yeah. uh, you know it never feels like oh it's down to the wire but uh i think it'd be better for us if we had three or four episodes in the can um but we just don't and yeah, that's it's okay. just, yeah it's, it's really hard okay. we are responsible that. adults we will get your story to you <laughs> <laughs> now the other it's question i had I, I want to talk to you a little bit about sort of promotion of it and then what you're doing uh, right now but the other thing I wondered is do you, since you write children's books do you think you'd ever do this format of reading the book uh, in for your younger audience do you think like doing that do you know I mean I think it sounds like a great idea uh-huh. the problem is because you know the friendship album 1933 is mine I, I'm not writing it for a publisher I'm yeah. not under contract with my children's fiction I'm not sure I could do that. I'm under contract right now for like two new books with Simon and Schuster. I I would have to look at the contract. That's so can interesting. I go ahead and do a uh, a story that I'm yeah in progress. Right. I don't know. I would yeah. I, I, I wouldn't do it without talking with yeah someone. hugely right because you've got you've got a contract relationship. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I get so, it. It's funny. But I love that idea, yeah, you know, or and I, there are more more podcasts for kids, yeah. uh, which I think is really cool. And I wish more of those, I don't think there were any of those when my kids were little. And it's yeah. such a great idea. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you could imagine, I mean, I'm just, this is just my imagination, but you could imagine having a podcast like that where it was tied into the educational component so that mm-hmm. like, you know, and you were talking about the writing process and also the story um, right. and creating characters. And that would be so cool for kids and teachers yeah. To know that they had a 10 minute or 15 minute, like as you were writing, like this is what I wrote this week kind of thing, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, I think mm-hmm. it'd be cool. Cause I think, I don't know. I feel like we don't give enough. There's no, there's kind of a disconnect between how we teach writing to kids and the real process. There's a sense of like, it's so structured and that they don't understand that grownups struggle as much as they do. The struggle doesn't go away. That's um, right. And if they only understood that they kind of need to just embrace the struggle as opposed mm-hmm. to that kind of awful feeling inside sometimes before you write, like that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I have a book coming out for kids. I, I don't know if it's going to be out in 2019 or 2020, but it's called How to Build a Story. Oh, and that's I, great. I love it. Yeah, because and and, I'm all about process. I mean, yeah. We talked about them last time. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're a- absolutely right that kids – you know, they're given kind of a, a formula and they're, and you know, a formula is not a bad thing. No, it's not bad. But, there, but it doesn't mean that there's not going to be a struggle. 
right? It's not just plugging into the formula. It's like, here's a guide for plot. And that's what I'm going to, what I talk about in this book, but I still also talk about the process, which is a lot of messing up and, uh, you know, and, and, yeah. and also I talk a lot about bad first drafts because first drafts are a struggle. You yeah. meet some people who love the first draft yeah. and revise, but I think most of us struggle with it and it's not just kids. And yeah, that, and no, it's not. To hear that message. And that writing is an expression of whatever you're thinking inside. It's that mm-hmm. externalization of whatever your brain is thinking and that mm-hmm. that's really a beautiful thing and that that's what they should be thinking about, not getting freaked out that they have to put a word on the page, you know? Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so it always feels like me when my kids in school, that the teacher was like, the, the, the emphasis was on the wrong thing sometimes. Do you yeah. know what I mean? That it was about, I mean, structure is important, but about the kind of expression of enjoyment of play that, right. um, that they're not getting that part of it. And they're getting so stressed about writing. Yes. Um, and that's not good. Because they, they, then they get to college and to law school and they're just a mess because they've got all this baggage about how they're not a good writer or they don't know how to write or they hate right. writing and all that. Um, Are you dealing with students like that? No, all the time. Yeah. 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 Right. The trauma of writing. And it's like, you know, for law students, like you've just, you're in a profession where that's what you do. You write. Like you can't be freaked out about writing because like you just, yeah. that's all you do as an attorney is write. Um, so... But I was taught, I use the analogy for me, uh, for me, it's like running, yeah. which uh, I think when I was a kid, I didn't like to run and we'd have to do the president's physical fitness uh, exam. Yes, All that was awful. After not preparing or practicing, we had to run the 600 yard dash. And of course there were people who would run really, really fast and you'd be keeping up with them. And then you'd get to the finish line and throw up, right? Because <laughs> it was just traumatizing. And it wasn't until I got older in college where I, where I learned it's like, yeah, if you start out slowly, <laughs> totally yeah, build those muscles, right? Yeah. That, that, and that, and writing is the same way. It, yeah. it is painful, but the more you practice and we right. talked about this one last time, the easier it gets, the less painful. And for some people it will never be fun, but yeah. you can get to a place where it's not staring at that blank page or that blank screen and freaking out. Yeah. And that's a to be <laughs> it's so funny you know I, this is a little too much about me but um I, I don't spend a lot of time talking to writers at writing but I love it but I from the time I was a grad student I always wrote every day like every day I had to write something and then after I became a full professor I took a year off accidentally to do this project um and uh, and quilted every night instead of writing every morning like that was the sort of what I did um yeah. and then went back to writing about mm, about four or five weeks ago and it was so joyous but it was mm-hmm. like after all that time of like that like it had gotten kind of arduous and kind of ugh, you know like yeah. I don't know just I get I felt like gummy gummed up you know and so taking that year off and doing something else this in the same manner um it, it was such a joy to come back to writing it was so interesting mm-hmm. to to see that there's that, that both of that side of like working those muscles and always having it but then kind of I felt like I overworked them and uh needed a little resting yeah. so It's interesting. It's weird. So, okay. All right. So quilt fiction. The other thing about it is, um, so it's a great podcast. Totally. Um, What I thought was really interesting about what's happening now is you started the Facebook group now. And also you've got a giveaway going. So, and so often when we start these projects, we feel like we have to do everything at the beginning. You know, like Mm -hmm. everything has to start at the beginning. And this is kind of in the middle of what's happening, that you've got these new things. And I thought that was so clever. And I wanted to talk more about it. And also we're going to post this so people know more about the Facebook group and also the giveaway that's happening. So do you want to fill us in on both of those aspects? Okay. Um, You know, as, as as with first drafts, I often don't know what I'm doing when I start out. So it's sort of like, let's, let's put on a show and then we'll see what happens. Yeah. And so starting the podcast and, you know, first of all, I was like, will anyone listen to it? And as it turns out, people have been listening That's to great. it. And I thought, well, okay, so now we have an audience and what do, what do we do? And my husband was, well, you know, we should do a closed Facebook group. And of course me, be me, I was like, but nobody will join. What if nobody <laughs> joined? Right. But people join. But the reason... I wanted to do a closed group and it's called the quilt fiction club is one for if people wanted to talk about uh the the story uh-huh. but also to kind of create a community ar- yeah. around story around quilt stories 
I don't know. You know, the, the, the group has to take its shape organically and, and yeah. people will bring energy to it and, and will shape what, what happens. But I, I would love there to be a writing component where people want to write stories that we would have a place, that would be a place where they could That's share really their cool. stories. But I, I love that idea of just um, also because then I get to go, you know, I'm writing the story about 19... 19- 30s Ohio and I've got lots of pictures and information uh-huh. to share and, That's and great. Uh, you know and I love old magazines and we have collected now about 30 or 40 farmers wife so magazines cool. so I'm starting to share like it, it, look at this picture look at this ad and people you know if you love that stuff yeah um, it tells pictures, you so much yeah. about sort of the mindset and what was going on there it's yeah. really interesting doesn't it and the graphic design is yeah. great it's super cool but also we've just um, now we just have started the group like a week ago but in the story there's a Wednesday quilting bee so now we are having a Wednesday quilting bee and one of the things in the story someone always brings cake really the bee has become a, about cake which I, I think is a good thing um, and so you know so we're going to do the, the Wednesday bee and it's really a chance for people to show their work and their that's work. very cool and so what are you going to do on a Facebook quilting bee on Wednesdays how does that work exactly well, part of it, and this is, you know, it's a little like world building and it's fun. I mean, and I think that if people can be civil war reenactors or go to Renaissance fairs and mm-hmm. or dress up like anime characters that once one day a week that quilters should be able to pretend that we're having a bee in 1930s Ohio. It's really cool. Uh, yeah. And so, and some of it, and so last week, which was the first bee, we had it at a at Eula's house. Eula Baker's a character in the story. And so I put up pictures. Here's what I imagine Eula's house to look like. Here's what I imagine her kitchen to look That's like. Really cool. Here's what she's wearing and got it, you know, found a 1930s dress that seemed Eula-esque to me. Um, and then people just post it. Then and people put up pictures of their work and you know, it's amazing what people are sharing too. Not just their own quilts, but like their grandmother's quilts from yeah. the 1930s. But I like that idea of that we can play some in this group as well. I love and to, that. I posted a Christmas story um, it's called it's called a friendship album Christmas 1932 so it actually starts a little bit before the novel and I've just posted it to the Facebook group along with the pattern we'll send out a link um, to our newsletter subscribers later in the week but I wanted that to be special for the group so it's a very nice group we have about 200 people so it's amazing they're lovely but um yeah so it's it's fun and I have to be careful because I just want to hang out with my group also. that's really cool I love it now, do yeah. you will you encourage them to do fan fiction or fan quilts or any of that kind of stuff related? No, I hadn't thought about that. And that uh, fan quilts definitely, I, um, fan, you know, they're welcome to do fan fiction. I hadn't thought about that. or well, letters. I'm, they could write letters, right? Letters, yes. How I great would them. that be, right? Of their own characters. I mean, here's a list. Well, also, right. and that ties into the Farmer's Wife magazine, which readers wrote amazing letters. And I actually thought about doing a, a story. I may do this, which is just a series of Farmer's Wife ma- magazine letters, and people could send letters to that. That's I love cool. It. Yeah. I love it. And so now we're doing the giveaway, which any yeah, um, which talk about. Let's talk about. about the giveaway. So why the giveaway? What? Why do you do it? We did. We've done two giveaways. And I'm curious what what i'm curious about a number of elements of the giveaway there are a number of reasons to do the giveaway one is um to do something fun for the people who are listening Mm -hmm. to but also it's a way of drawing new listeners and um yeah and so you know i've posted about the giveaway on the various places that i post about the the podcast every week i post in a number of online facebook quilting groups Mm -hmm. or Facebook, yes, just Facebook quilting groups. Yeah. About that. so, I've also posted about um, the giveaway, and one of the, to to enter the giveaway, you have to subscribe to the the quilt fiction newsletter, mm-hmm. and you just you enter once and you're entered for all day twelve days. This is mm-hmm. a twelve day of Christmas giveaway. So, so the giveaway is one way to say Merry Christmas. Thanks. These are amazing prizes. I hope you win because I like you. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I would also like your email address. Now, a yeah. number of people who are entering are already our subscribers. Yeah. Uh, but this is a way of getting new subscribers. So yeah. it's also a marketing ploy. Huge. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. the email is the, the property that people really want is the email for newsletters because then you, then you have a direct relationship with 
Because yeah. Facebook is great, but it doesn't give you the same kind of property interest in the like, email matters um, well, in email, our world. And you don't know what Mark Zuckerberg's going to do on any given day. He could close down your group yeah. or make you pay for it or whatever. And so email yeah. is a way to be able to really contact and connect. Yeah, interesting. But people don't want the newsletter after they enter the giveaway. They can just unsubscribe. Okay? Um, yeah. Just unsubscribe. But, yeah. um, and, and, and we're very good about we're not going to come after you. But it is a way. And, and it's a way of making people hear the podcast, too, right? So I'm posting on Instagram. People who've never heard about the Quilt Fiction podcast will go to the Quilt Fiction page. And, and I've heard from people going, oh, I'd never heard about this. I've entered the giveaway and I love your podcast. Yeah, so that's great. So that's, it's about really increasing our audience. So it's simple. It's just subscribing to the newsletter. How, mm-hmm. What about the sponsors? Tell me about sort of how you chose them and how did you contact them? Did you already have relationships with them? Some of them I already had relationships with. So, for instance, with Quilt Folk, um, I, I, uh, the editor is Mike McCormick. Right. And he's been interested in the Quilt Fiction podcast because he's mm-hmm. a guy who's interested a lot. So he would gotten in touch with us over the summer and we and it's been some promotion stuff with my with Quilt folk and my books already yeah right i saw that that's really cool really cool so i reached out to him and said can you know would you uh be a sponsor and donate a a one-year subscription to cool folk yeah sure and that's i mean that's the amazing thing is people are so nice yeah this i don't know what is scarier is reaching out to people who you know and saying give me something for free or reaching out to people who you don't know like mark i don't know the people at mark miller Uh they're sponsor or paintbrush studios another sponsor didn't know them reached out so nice yeah reached out to ulfa they're like oh yeah you know i'm like so i'm um and and ulfa i have to say they're doing a they, they're donating a rotary color cutter it's aquamarine it is that's the cool. coolest thing. that's very uh, cool so, so yeah island batik sent a, a 12 layer cakes a beautiful beautiful fabric and you're just like people are, are nice and you know obviously we're yeah. promoting them and what have you but um it's just been amazing so we you know bonnie hunter who i know and so bonnie mm-hmm. i could reach out to and um brad at orafel because yeah. because i'm the quilt alliance board so there were some yeah. relationships there where like right. i am focused on our friendship and, and asked for this right and you're welcome so, yeah. that's very cool well i love it it's very interesting and then uh, each is it each day starting today that you choose a winner yes we'll choose a winner each night at 10 there's a different thing for each day so today it's a fat quarter shop gift certificate for 25 dollars. tomorrow's the paintbrush studio fabrics um then we've got crystal so and then one day is bonnie hunter one day is crystal watson fabrics. so each one so each one is that yeah. Yeah. that's very cool i love yeah. it and then you, and then once they they win, you get their address and you send it to them. Right, depending on what it is. So one of our giveaway things is a year membership to um, the Quilt Show with Alex Anderson and Ricky Timms. Oh, cool. And so I will just I will get the winner's information and connect yeah. and get that right to um, to the people cool. there at the Quilt Show. Same with the Quilt Quilt folk. Get an address, send it to, to now, Mike. Now you did it internationally right did you you did not yeah. limit it to the u.s i did limit it to the u.s oh you did oh yeah okay. because, and partly because a lot of the stuff will be shipped directly from the sponsors yeah so i can't say will you do this and by the way you're going to have to ship it to australia yeah. there are some digital things um that that if you so you can enter if you're from out of the country but you'll only be eligible to win the digital stuff oh that makes sense okay cool yeah. that's cool and that makes sense sometime in the spring to do a special giveaway for our international right. people um because right. i can't worry about that but postage is really really expensive yeah it is and there's yeah. all these legal issues too like canada's got some weird stuff on giveaways so we oh, we really? on our side of it we limited it to yeah because we um that you can't do chance i think like huh. they, it only has to be a contest i think for canada um, I don't know if anybody's paying attention to the laws, right? But I think that there's some weirdness on Canada's side on what you can and can't do in Canada. That's so, yeah. So, but nobody, I mean, that's the thing is like law, yeah. Do people pay attention? Not usually, right? So, yeah. Unless it's like, it's like um, you know, so, uh, so yeah. So um, we limited it to that. Um, there's a couple of states that do weird stuff, but we found that it was, as long as it's under $500, you're in good mm-hmm. shape. So, all right. 
so that's cool. That's very exciting. And so it starts today. Can people enter throughout the time or is? Yes. And as soon as you enter, then you will be entered into, you know, so if you entered Wednesday, it would be, yeah. you would be eligible for Wednesday on. Obviously, it's not retroactive. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you can enter at any, any time during the giveaway. Okay, cool. Um, okay. And tell us about, um, so that's why we're having a fast interview because we're trying to get it up before I have to leave yeah, yeah. today. <laughs> that's like the um, logistics of our interview is like, we got to finish it so we can post it so people can know about the, um, the giveaway. All right. Um, tell us also quickly about Quilt Alliance and what you're doing for Quilt Alliance. Well, I am on the board of the Quilt Alliance. The Quilt mm-hmm. Alliance is a nonprofit that was formed to help preserve and document quilt stories um, and document quilts. Yeah. We don't preserve quilts. Sometimes people come up and say, I've got a, my grandmother's quilt. Do you guys want it? It's like, right. no, that's not we do. Uh, a lot of what we're about is documenting quilt stories and encouraging quilters to both document their quilts, but also to record the stories about the quilts that are really meaningful in their lives. And uh, one of the things that I do for the Quilt Alliance is um, a, a web show that's available to members called Story Bee, in which I interview uh, people in the quilting world of interest. Like I just interviewed Weeks Ringle and Bill Kerr, which was cool. fabulous. And awesome. they are uh, so, so such an They're great. This week I'm interviewing Joe Cunningham, a.k.a. Joe Quilter. Uh-huh. But I've, I've interviewed, and it's great because I can go, you know, I'd really like to talk to Denise Schmidt. Can we try to interview her? And, yeah. and Amy, Miller, the executive director, is like, yeah. I like sure. Amy. Amy's great. So how yeah. often are you interviewing then for, uh, for this project? Well, you know, we put out episodes once a month, but uh, we're trying to get a lot in the can. And so in the last two weeks, I think I've done four interviews. And it's what we were talking about earlier. Sometimes you just get so caught up in the conversation. Yeah. Uh, and, and part of the inter that it goes on for a long time. And part of the interview is takes place in the person's space, like their, uh-huh. their studio space. Oh, cool. or, um, you know, if they've got a business. And so there's always this, we, we do the questions and then we stop and then they get set up. And that is, of course, when the technical difficulties start. So That's sometimes so true. Can for quite a while because they're having to, they have to have someone with them who's walking around with an iPad and recording them as they do the tour. But it's amazing to, to see where people work. It's really interesting. I'm always like, yeah. what, what kind of iron do you have? What kind right. of sewing? That's is, really cool. I love it. I love yeah. it. So you are immersed in stories of quilting in every aspect in amazing ways from Facebook to your your quilt fiction to uh, your podcast to Quilt Alliance. You are just all about the story, which is really cool. I'm all about the story. Yeah. I really am. So, yeah. So it's been neat to be able to do all these different things because, of course, there's all different kinds of storytelling. Yeah. Um, yeah, so but it's 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 really fun. It's really so fun. Interesting. It's really fun. Now on the quilt fiction, you'll eventually sell the book. So and you'll do a self you'll self publish that book. So I'm, I'm I guess the last question I have is sort of the monetization aspect of it. Like how yeah. much is to push? You know, how much is it to grow the audience to purchase the book? How much is it just to to organically grow a community? So we're at that state now with our project of trying to understand what what did we what are we doing right? So um, I'm curious what your thoughts are about this interesting space of podcasting and Facebook groups and what it all means. I yeah no that's a really interesting question and it's something that I'm pondering because you know particularly say with the closed Facebook group and you're interacting with people and they really love what you're doing and you know a lot of the, these people will. Uh, if they haven't already read my published books, we'll buy them. Yeah, and, you know, right. And, It'll and, create goodwill and strengthen the brand and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. and it's um, but it's, it's it's a weird thing a little bit because you know it's like that's why and sometimes we're creating this audience because we want them ultimately to buy books and mm-hmm. uh, the, you know and and at the same time it feels like oh okay now I'm going to cash in on this personal relationship. Right. With- it's weird, right? <laughs> it is weird. Yeah. It is- I wish yeah. that I were just rich because I would just do this. I would do it anyway, yeah. right? I mean, right now I am doing it for free. Yeah. Uh, but it, with the hopes that that, that later um, I, I'll be able to monetize it. Now, it may be that the pattern with this becomes that um, once I finish with Friendship Album 1933, 
um, that we'll leave it up for a while. And then maybe I'll start on a sequel and start posting that, but then take the first book offline. And yeah. if you want it, then, you, then you're going to have to, you know, then you, you'll have to buy it. But right. the second book will be available for free. Yeah. I love the idea of doing free stuff. And like yeah. I just posted the story that we're going to, in the Quilt Fiction Club, but that we're also going to send a link to all our uh, subscribers. Um, it's a it's a lot. It's a it's a Christmas story. It's like thirty pages long. It's really nicely formatted. And my husband, who's very talented, did a beautiful cover for it. And I love the idea. It's like here, this is a gift yeah. I'm giving to you. And I you know don't ask anything in return. Obviously, the you know if it creates goodwill, that's yeah. fine. That's not what I'm doing. But that yeah. I'm. I did an interview for Quilt Alliance just last week with Luana Rubin, who is uh, her, has an online store called eCulture. It's been there okay. for twenty years, and it's real. It was so interesting talking to her because of this stuff. Because they give a certain percentage of their um, money of what they take in to charity, and it's a it's a fairly high. I mean, high percent. Like I don't know if it's two percent or five percent, but you know it's. And she does a ton of charity stuff. And um, and I just thought it was neat how she's got this business. Yeah. She's making money. But there's part of it, that money, yeah. that she, she is putting back into the world right. to make things happen. Like a social and good. And I really like yeah. that model. It's, it's getting mm-hmm. more, I mean, these benefit corporations and other things that we were talking, um, I'm talking to a tax professor at Tulane chatting about our project and what we want to do and she was saying that she felt like that she thinks the trend will be away from nonprofits and more towards these benefit corporations that allow you to do good but also mm-hmm. have less restrictions than and but there's also tax benefits um, to be a benefit corporation so we're going to have an interview with her but I think okay. it's really interesting that we are in a space of like doing good that it isn't just you know we just want, like, I don't know. I just think it's it's interesting. So it's interesting yeah. to see that that company is doing that. Yeah. I, well, and I'll be interested to hear this interview. And when you talk about your project, you t- you're talking about the book that you're working on. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, well, we are trying to figure out what we are, right? So that's the next step is um, the book. Yes, we'll do a book. But in terms of experimenting, we want to kind of keep experimenting. So we've got a number of things we're thinking about. Um, that are we have to make a decision actually we have to make a decision really soon because I got to get it approved um, mm-hmm. but that will probably take part of the project outside of the university because of the nature of it so the three things we're thinking about is a copyright like kind of a dispute platform I'm calling it right now balance so the idea is if you had a problem you could come to us and we could help quickly resolve it using a number of techniques and and mm-hmm. things to get you through if, so, if like somebody stole something or I want to design something I don't know if it's if it I'm gonna have a problem that you could quickly find out um, through this system um, that one makes some sense with our project um, mm-hmm. the other one is we're looking at a con- at like it's not a consignment shop but using consignment platform uh, to I let people do uh, various ways of selling. So um, we as a project could sell stuff when we have, you know, stickers or whatever. But if we right. have you as a guest on, we can ask you if you would be willing to list your book. And so mm-hmm. we would have a way to do kind of affiliate linking where we get a small percentage of the sale. But you also then it just goes directly to you and you don't have – you're not selling us wholesale copies. But right. it's an easy way to sort of build a brand of just want a quilt but also follow our our guests and our, our army so that as you continue to go, you grow and go, that you can be like, hey, I've got a new book. We're like, cool, let's interview you and let's right. add it to sort of what you do on our platform. So um, right. will you still have complete control over um, putting it up and shipping and all those things, but we take a tiny percentage for um, being kind of a, a platform or a public. Of, so that's that one. And then um, building the brand. So what the brand means and what the army means. And so can we have, can we take the cultural capital that we have, like your 200, I mean, you have 200 in like a week. It's incredible. So 200 mm-hmm. followers and Give them some buying power so that, it, you know, so that if you're like, hey, guys, what if we ask, um, you know, some quilt, uh, some fabric company to reproduce fabric and we, you know, like, how do you get crowdsourcing and crowd 
um, the user generated component of these Facebook groups to have more the presence than just being kind of posting. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the thing we're thinking about. Um, it's like what kind of cultural capital and economic capital can you have from these groups? That's more right. than just a subscribing base and more than just a buying base. Um, but buying base isn't terrible, you know, right. so thinking that through too. So that's kind of the more sophisticated side of the project is thinking that through. And then also the quilt, the book. So that I'm writing the book over the holidays. Yeah. And then we're going to try to self-publish it. Um, even, we've got some nice, I mean, it was nice for publishers to be interested. So that was great. Mm-hmm. But I think we're going to um, self-publish so we have more control and so we can do it quickly. And we yes. can keep the price what we want it to be and also make a bit of money because it's hard right. to make money, at least in the quilting books, from the publishers. Oh, yeah. um, and that's, we really need money for the project. So it's, And then... And then I'll tell you the last thing and let you go because you asked and it's like we're at like the middle of the kind of trying to think things through. Um, right. We're going to really focus on shops and quilting guilds with the copyright book because we think that that is the um, – the, they norm the, uh, the population. So if mm-hmm. they understand copyright and they are the copyright police already, like they are the ones saying what you can and can't do. And if we right. can give them tools and a workbook, um, then that will help them – um, it, it will help the ecosystem to all be on the same page. We want industry to, to read it and to be part of it too. But we think right. that if we can sort of target the, the guilds and the shops, um, that that would be a way to really make an impact. Yeah. What's so. the stuff that, I mean, it's also interesting. And the thing is, is that you start a project like this and other possible, you know, the possibilities start opening up. Yeah. As to what right. Yeah. But yeah, and also it sounds like that balance that, that you have that, trying to work out that same balance because you do have this quilting army yeah you know which is wonderful and your closed group is a great group I'm a member of that I love it yes I'm so thrilled that you're part of it and that's been so fun to have famous people and industry people and regular people all having these conversations um and and that's I think to me the beauty of the closed group is the kind of conversations you can have so it is people you know and so it's it's funny that kind of this is it's personal it's business yeah it's you know, and again, and, and I, I I wouldn't say I'm struggling with it because the people who listen, they know I'm an author. This is how I, they I, know. I, right. I, they know. Um, but I hope that w- to find that balance where, where I do get to give things away or be, you know, yeah. know and, and, and give and receive. Because yeah. I also feel like on that group, I'm rec- particularly as people share their family stories yeah. about you know, in the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, so great. It's uh, it's amazing to me. So that, yeah, but we are interesting entering. I think a, a new way of doing business and Hugely. creating. Community. That's right. Um, and you just yeah, you want to be good to your people. We want to be good to our people, and it's what you're saying is that you know we've gotten some um, people have been very generous and nice to the project over the year, but now it's sort of thinking through like, well, what is it that we're doing, right? Like, what are we as a brand? Where, right. where do we sit in this world? What is our philosophy? Um, and keeping that, keeping it authentic. And I think that's always a challenge, um, as you get bigger, but Mm -hmm. it's really, I feel like it's amazing, right? I mean, just when people talk about these groups, they're real and the friendships are real and the people are real and it's a really amazing space. I just find I'm thrilled that we're part of this quilting experience and the online experience of it because it's just spectacular i mean it's what you're experiencing um these are Mm -hmm. incredibly thoughtful kind people um that are participating in things they care about and that's really cool so i i don't take i just think it's awesome i do too and um and i'm glad it's allowed us to connect and be friends Awesome. Yeah. I love it. And we always have great conversations. And you always, I always feel like it's semi therapy session with me with writing. <laughs> so. I'm happy to help. <laughs> it's so funny. Oh my goodness. What ridiculousness. I always feel a little bit shy when I talk to you because I'm like, I, I, I can't help it because I'm like, and this is what's happening. Like, I'm like, you know. You know, the double space versus the single space. Like, have you converted? Like, right? So, like, can you can you type? I still have to write with double spaces and then take the extra space out because I need the time to think. Yeah. I, you know? I'm still really bad with commas. If that makes commas? Sense. Commas, yeah. man. Yeah. My my kid loves to harass me about my comma use. Oh, um, so funny. Well, <laughs> My kids just like to harass me in general. <laughs> just in general. Well, that's their job, right? We have them so that they can just harass us, you know? 
<laughs> just kind of remember. Mind. But thank you so much for doing this interview. And, of course. And- well, let's um, let's end so I can get it posted before I have to go off on more adventure. I am yeah. so thrilled that um, we have this relationship, and I can't wait to see what happens with um, with Quilt Fiction and the Facebook group and the giveaway. So I entered. I totally okay. answered. So we'll okay. see. Um, so it's fun. Um, and thanks again. I really do appreciate you chatting. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's great talking to you. All right. Fabulous. And you're cool with me posting without reviewing? Post without reviewing. Awesome. Okay, awesome. cool. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today. 